Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second session of ADB's 2020 Transport Forum. My name is David Fay. I'm a civil engineer and I've had the pleasure to work in the ADB East Asia and Pacific Department since 2012. I'm honoured to have been invited to be the mediator for this session, Sustaining Road Infrastructure Quality in Asia and the Pacific, Challenges and Opportunities. Um, this forum is a collaborative meeting of decision makers and influencers intended to open dialogue and seek constructive comment on the effectiveness of ADB transport sector interventions. ADB take instruction from developing member countries on their desired road investments. And so the goal of these gatherings is to spark interest in the hope that we can influence them to take action to reach for improvements in road network management practices. Recall, please, that the very justification for the establishment of ADB in 1966, and indeed its ongoing existence, is to reduce poverty. So with that poverty reduction goal in mind, ADB engage in road sector investments to promote regional integrations. So populations enjoy improved access to markets and benefit from the income earning opportunities therein. Road sector investments also improve access to services, for example, to public health and education and transport services. So better transport links give poor and marginalised populations improved access to markets and social services to enable them to escape poverty. Through physical connectivity, economic growth and regional development are catalyzed. So economic growth spillovers can be positive and negative, and so we come to ADB's goal to mainstream sustainable transport. So what does sustainable mean in this context? In the road sector in particular, we need to address very costly maintenance practice failings, take determined and strategic action to reduce road crashes, and search for more environmentally friendly solutions to serve our transport needs. So this morning's session's objective is to share thoughts on the practical challenges associated with achieving timely road maintenance in interventions. I emphasise timely because there is a sweet spot for maintenance as roads inevitably deteriorate with the passage of time. Importantly, please note um, that validated research has indicated that every $1 of road maintenance spending can save between eight to $11 on vehicle operating costs, travel time savings, reduced road crashes and avoided or delayed or offset rehabilitation and reconstruction of our roads. Timely maintenance extends the economic life of the most valuable asset in our countries, our road networks. This is a terrific opportunity. Uh, no one will suggest that road maintenance reform is easy, but we need to do everything we can to help to make it happen. In our presentations today, we are proud to share the insights of genuine industry leaders and influencers, each with an important contribution. For over 50 years, ADB has worked with national road authorities across our developing member countries. The experiences and challenges in each country vary, but they are remarkably similar. We will put forward the experiences in Pakistan as a reason for hope and a source of inspiration for other countries who want to reform their road maintenance practices. We will learn of a long running research program supported by DFID to influence governments and development partners to improve access for rural populations. Recognising that the private sector is best positioned to deliver measurable node road network performance standards, we will introduce performance-based road maintenance contracts as an important first step toward commercialising road maintenance. In the last presentation, we will gain insights on Japan's use of technology in road maintenance planning and share important background on JICA's valuable contribution to the international motion road maintenance reform. So before we move to the presentations, uh, I'd like to thank you for your time this morning. Um, we encourage our partners' questions and active participation. Uh, at the bottom of your screens, um, 
you will see a Q&A button uh, after a number of short presentations and a question and answer session, we will open our expert panel to your questions to benefit from your thoughts, opinions and insights. So don't be shy at any time during the session today. Uh, please use that Q&A button and I'll put those questions to the panel uh, when I have the time. So Michelle, can I please ask you to ready the system so that we can move into presentations? Terrific. Uh, let me take a moment to introduce our first presenter, um, Mr. Ravi Perry. Um, with an interest in structural engineering, Ravi would start his career with the Indian Railways. Uh, with a penchant for deal making, he would move into the private sector and work with the Infrastructure Development Finance Company, where he would head, become the head of the Urban Infrastructure Group and Director PPP Initiatives. During his tenure, he, he structured roads, ports, airports, rail, metro rail, water and solid waste management transactions and would sit on the corporate boards of various infrastructure special purpose vehicles, eventually assuming the role of CEO for the Infrastructure Development Corporation in Karnataka, where he would catch the eye of ADB recruiters. Ravi joined the ADB in 2010 as a principal private sector specialist, directly advising the ADB South Asia Director General, before moving to his current role as the South Asia Transport Division Director. As the South Asia Transport Director, Ravi's mandate covers India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and the Maldives. Ravi and his team were responsible for processing transport projects of $2.2 billion value in 2018 and $3.6 billion in 2019. These lending volumes exceed those achieved by ADB's private sector operations and Pacific departments. That volume affords the South Asia transport team a good deal of influence, and I'm very glad for his time and participation this morning. Uh, Director Ravi will share insights on the common challenges and opportunities that ADB faces when we start a road maintenance discussion with our developing member countries. Sir, uh, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, David, and uh, good morning from Manila to everybody in whichever time zones you are in. Um, next slide, Michelle. So I'll take a few minutes to talk about uh, sustainability of road assets in a very practical kind of uh, outlook, which the operating departments actually face and our DMC colleagues uh, face similar situations. So looking at the key issues and challenges uh, for ensuring road asset sustainability. Next slide, Michelle. Pardon the uh, few cartoons which are around. I think that they give the picture uh, quite clearly. Uh, one of the issues which we face is what we call the leaky bucket issue, that we are going on uh, making capital investment into projects. And if these projects are not sustainable, so what happens is that capital investments are not, not efficient. So the picture is that of uh, pouring water into a leaky bucket. And uh, in many of our DMCs, we see that the initial investments are uh, quite strong, but because of lack of maintenance, these run down. And one of the issues which I see in terms of behavioral uh, aspects is that uh, new projects have a very strong visibility and glamour value. So when these are announced, everybody is very eager to, it makes press news, it's a big uh, capital, and therefore uh, the interest in these is much higher. Uh, who really cares if there's an announcement saying that 5,000 kilometers of roads will be maintained properly? But this is very similar to putting more water into a leaky bucket. So unless asset sustainability is assured, uh, the assets are not maintained, efficiency is very quickly lost. And uh, of David mentioned some figures, but there's some assessments that AIRR on road asset management is upward of 30%. Next slide, Michelle. So ADB has been, um, the transport portfolio has been increasing quite a bit. So if you look at the 2000s, we had about $2 billion a year. And 
uh, which was 26% of ADB's total portfolio. But a very large percentage of this was actually on road sector assets. Uh, going forward, the proportion of road sector assets will actually reduce because we are going much more into rail and into metro rail. But it's still a very large part of uh, ADB's lending uh, portfolio and assistance to countries. Next slide, Michelle. So um, what I'd like to point out here is that whether funded by budgets or through uh, ADB assistance, asset creation and rehabilitation seems to be much easier than maintenance. It's easier to define a specific project and say, we are creating a new road, rehabilitating a green field, brown field, whatever. But to say that we are maintaining a system of roads through a project uh, approach seems to be uh, not so much on people's minds. Next slide, please. And the question is, how does one fix uh, leaky buckets? So um, if I look at the cartoon which I placed on top, essentially you're looking at getting the proper systems in place and the knowledge of how to do it. Now, all our DMCs are extremely capable in thinking through this process. Uh, the problem I think is that the focus is more on asset creation for projects rather than on maintenance. So there are various uh, contractual mechanisms. One of the first one is uh, looking at changing from an item rate contract into something with extended maintenance. Um, so build in four or five years of maintenance into the contract itself. Shifting to design build uh, or EPC kind of contracts, again with extended maintenance tagged in. And newer models of PPP, such as the hybrid uh, annuity or extended concessions, in some of these models, the focus is not on bringing private sector investment, but making the private sector liable for a far longer time than just building a road and then the different liability period. So that is the change which we are looking at, not strictly in this particular presentation, not in bringing private sector capital as such. Then there are budgetary mechanisms, um, one of which is a covenant in loan agreements or in, bu in budget systems, which says that X amount of money will be allocated for forcing uh, maintenance funding. This is kind of difficult because budgets are voted uh, year on year and such a covenant may not be valid in the legislature. The third one, which is very popular in thinking is on maintenance funds. So one sets up a dedicated, possibly ring fence uh, maintenance fund. And this fund is supposed to be topped up by various sources of uh, revenue, uh, budgetary tolls uh, and so on, even fines on road vehicles. And then this fund will allocate uh, projects which are to be maintained on some system. But the underpinning of all this is that what cannot be measured or what is not measured cannot be managed. So in many cases, what we have is very poor data on the condition of the road assets even the inventory of what road assets are available, uh, the condition of traffic, uh, what levels of traffic are on and whether these are actually reliable, overloading of vehicles and so on. And what is the maintenance cycle? When was this last maintained? What was the expenditure on it? And what is going to be um, the maintenance cycle in the future? So in many cases, uh, this data is missing or not kept up to date. So we have many projects where actually investments were done uh, to create such an asset management system. But once the project is over, the updating does not, does not happen. Next slide, please. So is there a one size fits all solution for this? And my strong feeling is no, there cannot be. Uh, however, the importance of sustainability should be high on all planning minds. The principles of uh, this saying that we need data, we need to have realistic budget allocations, we need uh, databases to be up to date and to try to figure in whether we shift from only construction contracts to construction plus maintenance contracts. And in, in a behavioral sense to have less fixation on um, making new things but trying better to maintain what is already existing and which yields a far better value, even though it is not so visible uh, in terms of a new project. Uh, next slide. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Director Ravi. Okay, what is not measured cannot be managed. Never a truer word spoken. Look, let me let me now please move quickly uh, on to our next presentation. This is now the fourth transport forum where ADB has asked this gentleman to present on his 20 years of directly relevant experience in Pakistan, as they offer us a strong illustration of what can be done in a challenged budget environment by a respected road authority with a focused and strategic leadership. When the board discusses reform projects, they usually inquire of whether there is an, an in-country champion to improve the chance of success, usually in the form of a charismatic politician that with will and political might can pull through a difficult reform. In, in Pakistan, our champion is not a politician, um, which is fortunate as road asset management visions are long term and cannot fit an election cycle. This champion has developed Pakistan's road asset maintenance plans for the last 18 years. Uh, he has been on the roads calibrating bump test integrators and he has cajoled many ministers of finance into supporting long-term strategic and considered maintenance investments at the expense of their short-term political interests. Um, so he is now the general manager of the National Highways Authority. I'm very pleased to introduce to you, Mr. Saklain Haider. Uh, sir, can I please invite you to share your insights on your road maintenance management journey in Pakistan? Hello, Mr. Saklain, have you, I think your microphone, okay. there we go. Nice now it is on, sir. But I was saying thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk uh, on this forum about practical challenging uh, challenges and opportunities for improving sustainability of road assets in developing countries, especially uh, my experiences in Pakistan and some other neighboring countries where uh, I have visited. Um, so, uh, can we start the presentation? <clears throat> Next, please. So, I will be talking about asset management in developing countries, the practical issues by of adopting asset management system in uh, developing countries, opportunities which arise from adopting these asset management practices. What are the issues um, if you have adopted and there is a long uh, process of it, when you have gone through it, there are certain institutional problems which are faced. What are the continuity issues in RAMs and how can we uh, go ahead the way forward. So next please. Next slide please. <clears throat> as you can, uh, as all of you know, road are the core of a integral transport system and their uh, performances are uh, competitive, uh, our quality of life, economic competitiveness, and sustainability development. Sustainable road is an efficient and effective planned design, as effectively and efficiently planned, design, build, operate, upgrade, and preserve. Means that road administrators have integrated policies and are providing the expected social economic service in terms of mobility and service. In developing country due to shortage of funds, essentially whatever the money is available to road administrative uh, administrators, they have to try to use it to the optimum level. That means where there is a need, the money should be spent only there and uh, not anywhere else. The road authorities throughout the developing countries always shows keen interest in developing RAM's road asset management system. But there are certain challenges which are faced because um, the old 
um, system which they are using or whatever the procedures which are there they don't want to get away from that uh, so we find sometimes a lot of resistance of, um, in implementing and sometime after some uh, initially acknowledging adopting the implementation is stopped can we move to the next please in developing countries the asset management concept is not fully developed there are still they still think in many places that maintenance management system is the asset management system whereas this is not the case in maintenance management system you have budget you make a program and carry out the treatment but it is not the level of service which is there whereas asset management system defines the level of service you want to have for your uh, road network you have to understand what sort of revenues or the funding is available what is and then the need is established the program is prepared and then the implementation is carried out and in order to do this this is a continuous process every year so sometime what happens uh, can we move to the next please the lack of understanding of road asset management system resistance to change that people in authority feels that their power is taken out, away for doing uh, their own preferred maintenance type and so there is lot of resistance and this caused non implementation of rams and work cannot be sometime due to also because of the political interferences uh so road asset management uh, provides and eliminates chances of overspending in the work so misuse of funds cannot happen the there is a transparency and accountability process also with the road asset management system that when one year you make a program you adopt that program you carry out that program next year you will obviously get the results that how much your road network has improved from that maintenance and if that is not happening that means your system is not performing next please so the most important question for a road agency is to see what is what was the past condition of your road and performance of your road asset what is the current and predicted future condition and performance of your uh, road assets how you want uh, to manage it the best manner to provide a least inconvenience to the public and repair the facility and what are the consequences of not doing maintenance because in developing countries sometime you don't get the uh, desired funds and what sort of funding is available the resource envelope has to be seen next please so it is very important that money is always spent where it is needed the prioritization model should be there you should know where the money is going and it should affect uh, that overall road operating cost should be reduced it should improve the road condition and the average road roughness should be improved reduction in average travel time should be there you because rehabilitation cost more so you should plan in such a way that least money is going toward rehabilitation and investment is more toward routine and preventive maintenance for the longer durability of your road network the effective and efficient monitoring of maintenance works is also required 
can we go to the next slide, please? Sometime issue arises from long-term sustainability of ramps. I will give you an example that uh, uh, in Pakistan, we tried our business processes, adopted RAM system, and we initiated a maintenance management system way back in 1988. And after uh, 1988, we were following this maintenance management system. So when we introduced the concept of road asset management system, there was a lot of resistance from within the organization. That why we are, we are why we want to do this. We have a very good effective maintenance management system which is working. So it took a lot of effort to convince the agency, the um, administrators, the politicians that this is the best practice for the road network, for the authority, to, for the future for longer sustainability of your road network. So with this awareness coming to the agency, uh, the best practices were adopted. It become easier for everyone to feel the uh, that this is a practice which we have to carry out. And lesser time was consumed in doing it. The value of money was there. Otherwise, the forces will start working against the system and whole implementation and ultimately system will cease to exist. Can we move to next, please? There are sometimes continuity challenges also. That uh, introduction of asset management system, it is not that uh, with a click of pen you can introduce it in a overnight. It will take a long time, sometime yeah, many years. We can move on a little bit quicker. I'm just going to finish in just two slides, please. And involve huge, um, sorry. So asset management is a way of thinking. So your um, culture has to empower the staff and uh, the politician to have this continuity and have changed. Next, please. The major issues are not updating of asset management system. This is one of the practical issues which we face that people just want to adopt a system. They don't update their uh, systems. They are not willing to do that. Their survey equipments are outdated, they don't uh, adopt new techniques, inadequate secure funding is there, uh, sometime uh, enforcement is there, lack of failure of equipment and lack of spares. Can we move to next, please? <clears throat> um, coming to end of my presentation, I just want to say that in order to have sustainable development, it is very essential that road asset management system should play its part. Uh, it has to perform effectively and efficiently uh, with optimum utilization of funding and long sustainable uh, sustainability of road network. There should be a three tier approach that the top management, the medium uh, tier uh, management and the stakeholders, they are on board. You should Try to establish a dedicated source of road fund, prioritize your needs, adopt affordable standards, address deep-rooted institutional problems, implement appropriate management and quality systems, and tackle accountability and transparency issues. So thank you very much for giving me the time and opportunity, please. If you have any questions, I will be able to. Thank you, Mr. Haider. Yeah. Uh, valuable insights to offer. Um, so to all uh, uh, attendees, please continue to uh, insert your questions and uh, questions in the chat box uh, so that we can give them to our presenters later on. 
Um, we are indebted to the next presenter who has joined us from um, Johannesburg. It's 4.30 a.m. there. Um, and to Mr. Rukulo Leka Letter, we offer a genuine thank you for making yourself available at this most unsociable hour. Um, the Research for Community Access Partnership called RECAP is a research program that has been supported by DFID since 2004. The program acknowledges the direct relationship between the isolation of rural communities and the consequent poverty and disadvantage they endure. Um, the RECAP research is intended to influence policy and inspire governments and development partners to take action to improve accessibility for the rural poor. When talking of access, we refer to both the provision of transport services, be they buses or other transport forms, and actual roads or tracks or paths so that a rural father can take his daughter to a, a school or a health facility. And, and to recap, uh, this is implemented through a provision preservation access continuum uh, comprising three research targets that are critically linked. One, the provision of rural access. Two, the preservation or maintenance of rural access. And three, the effective use of rural access or transport services. With a background in highways engineering, um, Mr. Letter is the deputy team leader of, of infrastructure research for RECAP. He's been working on this research since 2008, and he's responsible for research in 12 countries in Africa, five countries in South Asia. Working with national governments and road authorities, his responsibilities include identification, formulation, and management of research projects related to cost-effective and sustainable provision and maintenance of rural access. Mr. Later, may I please ask you to take control of the desktop? Thank you. Thank you, David, and thanks for the uh, kind remarks. It is indeed a very early morning here. Um, but I'm very pleased to be participating in this forum. Um, what I would like to do first is just to give an overview of the uh, rural transport research programs that have been funded by DFID since uh, 2004. Um, obviously, they, they have been funding research previously, but uh, 2004 was the beginning of the so-called uh, research caps. Um, starting with the Southeast Asia Community Access Program, uh, commonly known as CCAP, which was implemented in three countries, Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia. And the, the focus of this initial program uh, was on implementation of research projects um, outside any, any sort of specific institutional setup. Uh, following the success of CCAP, um, DFID decided to, to roll out a similar program in, in Africa called the Africa Community Access Program, um, which was implemented in seven countries. And again, the, the, the focus was on implementation of research projects uh, uh, and thereby an institutionalization strategy was developed. And then in 2014, <clears throat> uh, following the success of both programs, if we decided to put them together uh, into one umbrella body, uh, umbrella program called the Research for Community Access Partnership. Uh, this covers uh, the 12 African countries and five Afcap, Af, Af, uh, ASCAP countries, Myanmar, Nepal, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. And it is through this program that research projects uh, were now being implemented and managed through new transport and road research centers that were established uh, with the support of RECAP. Next slide, please. So what, what were the benefits or what elements do we were, were put in place for the institutionalization of research programs? Uh, firstly, it was the establishment of transport or road research centers in partner countries. Uh, support to development of research business plans and strategic plans for the existing and new transport and road research centers. So what, what exactly are the benefits of this and why was it considered important to, to institutionalize the process of research? That gave firstly the strategic approach to identifying and prioritizing national research themes 
and critically sustain the funding and the implementation of research projects. Structured capacity building and mentorship programs for the personnel to competently and effectively carry out the research work. And, and, and one of the key areas of, of uh, this institutionalization that uh, uh, has a strong bearing on the sustainability of, of all these efforts is the motivation and retention of young and bright uh, researchers from tertiary institutions to see a career path uh, that would uh, ensure that provision of this uh, important aspect of, of delivery would be continuous and, and sustainable. And more importantly, creation of an enhanced awareness of the value of research and raising the profile of research among decision makers. Next slide, please. Um, so the whole process of, of, of research uh, uh, led into the development and production of research products uh, or knowledge products <clears throat> across the board uh, that includes manuals, guidelines, policy documents um, that would, once applied and embedded as policy, would then uh, um, reflect the, uh, uh, the cost effectiveness and, and thereby translate or transfer those benefits to the local communities. Next slide, please. So one of the key, uh, key uh, projects, uh, flagship projects that the Draft Recap implemented is the Rural Accessibility Index um, <clears throat> that uh, uh, has a bearing on, on uh, poverty alleviation and poverty reduction, um, where you look at, at accessibility as, uh, as, as a key element in, in ensuring that um, uh, accessibility, uh, poverty, I mean, poverty reduction is, uh, uh, I, I mean, areas that require uh, uh, poverty uh, alleviation and reduction are clearly identified through the, the index. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so what are the key elements of, uh, we also looking at, as I indicated earlier, that the, the, the research for community access program uh, started in 2014 and, and due to end in 2020. And there is a key need for um, an exit strategy or there is an exit strategy that is being developed so that uh, all that has been developed over the years is not lost. There is continuity and, and we are launching a, an open call to, to MDBs, to everyone, anyone, any organization that is interested in, in um, inheriting some of the, some of the uh, key elements of, of this program for continuity sake. The main issue, the main one being the hosting of the Rural Access Library that houses all the, the knowledge products that have been developed over the years and, and that still need uh, updating, validation, and, and uh, in the future, because knowledge does not end, knowledge has to be developed continuously. So we appeal also to, to those entities that would be interested in this to um, um, reach out and, and respond to the call that, that will be made in the next week or so. Next slide, please. So there are specific recommendations judging from um, what the, 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 the line of uh, the, the, the policy, transport policies of the ADB are and, and the modus operandus. Um, we are recommending that um, ADB consider housing or hosting the, the RECAP Rural Access Library. So as to continue with, the, with these efforts um, to improve accessibility, poverty reduction, and, and importantly, to, 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 to for, for, for the specific rural access index to take it to the next level, to tier one, which, which, which entails um, use of the, the recent innovations 
in terms of measurement uh, that is accurate, uh, that is repeatable, and, and, and also uses, uses technology. So um, these, these, these are some of the recommendations that you, ADB can, can consider and have a look at. Next slide, please. So in terms of access to, to, to the rural access library and, and access to all the knowledge products that have been developed through RECAP, uh, uh, those can be accessed uh, on, that, uh, on, the web, on the RECAP website as shown in this slide. And I'm, I'm happy to uh, participate in any question and answer session so as to provide further clarity on the, on, on the work that RECAP has done in Terrific. the rural transport arena. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Letter. Um, uh, please keep those questions coming through. Uh, we're getting a few already, which is good to see. So our, our next presenter is, is, uh, is Dr. Ian Greenwood. He will present on the important incentive schemes and intricacies behind performance-based maintenance contracting. Um, with experience in more than 25 countries across five continents, and with extensive work in both developed and developing nations, uh, Dr. Greenwood brings informed and practical insights and recommendations to the difficult road maintenance management reform task. Uh, ADB consider the introduction of performance-based road maintenance contracts as an important first strategic step uh, to enable road authorities to establish the capacity to collect, store, process, and analyze road condition data, uh, this being the critical enabler to move toward a prioritised road maintenance investment regime. Um, with a decorated history advising both the ADB and the World Bank and the establishment of road asset management systems and the introduction of innovative maintenance contracting forms uh, to exploit the efficiencies of the private sector, uh, I'm very pleased to invite Dr Greenwood to assume control of the desktop. Thank you, David. And uh, Michelle will flick. So so the first thing to think about when we're talking performance-based contracting or commercialization, sorry, we'll just go back one, Michelle there, um, is that uh, there's a whole continuum of contracts. And even if you were to pick up the World Bank standard um, bidding document for output and performance-based routing uh, maintenance contracts, the implementation of those around the world is quite different. So that what, by the time that's customized and actually delivered, those contracts are fundamentally on quite a big spectrum in their own right. What we do know though, is as we move from input-based contracts through output and outcome, we see a lot more innovation. We see a lot more um, risk transfer, we, but we also see more uh, cost savings and a longer term um, contracts coming through. So while at the input base, we might be dealing single year or maybe two year contracts. As we move through, we're talking you know, five year, 10 year, 20 year, and in some cases, 99 year contracts I've seen when we go in full out to concessions. So all those things happen in a continuum. Uh, next slide. Uh, the important part though, is to not think of the contract model as a contract model, but what does it actually deliver to you as a road authority? And one of the things we really do understand now is that you can use the contract model to actually drive your asset management improvements. And as uh, David just mentioned, you know, it's seen as a way to get into this. And what we understand is that if you're doing things, whether it's in-house or uh, maybe outsourced, but on an input basis, there's no real driver to actually do better asset management. You just live in that maintenance model that uh, was mentioned earlier. But as we move through to outcome or performance-based contracts, it drives you to actually become better at asset management because you have to, to be able to do the contract. Uh, next slide. So again, the strengths and weaknesses of these contracts is often not a strength or a weakness of the contract, but a strength or weakness of the road authority themselves. So I can take the exact same contract document, put it in two different countries, and one will say, this is a great contract because it deals with risk for me and manages risk. Another client will say, 
I don't like this contract because we've got already in-house really good risk management processes, and this is taking some of that away. So what you actually have to do is look at, say, what is the problem you are trying to deal with? And then you look and say, and how does the contract model help you deal with that? So for some, it's about how do I reduce costs? For some, it's how do I manage risk better? How, some, it's how do I actually get better construction quality? And that's the um, comment was mentioned earlier of having a construction uh, contract with three, four, five years of maintenance afterwards. It drives that better construction quality. For some, it's about getting better service levels, more consistent, a focus on service levels. And for some, it's saying, you know, our own in-house force account staff are getting old and we don't have the ability to recruit more, so we need to actually look out to the private sector. So all of those are different drivers and will define for you whether or not you think an outsourced contract is good for you or not. Uh, next slide. What we do know though, is if we're going to do these well and we want to be successful, we need to actually make sure the contract is set up to get a contractor to think like a road authority would like to be able to think. So it's a selection of roads. You're not just picking you know, isolated um, links of bad road and saying that's my contract. We want the contractor to actually have a network that they can efficiently get around. You know, there'll be some good bits of road, there'll be some bad bits of road, and that's how you actually may maintain a road network yourself. You don't have a road maintenance unit and say, oh, you just get one kilometre here and then drive five or ten kilometres to another. And I've actually looked at one project and reviewed a project where there was over a day's drive from one bit of the network to another. And then the client was complaining because the contractor wasn't responsive. And the reality, it was impossible to be responsive because of the way you actually picked the network. But what we do need to also look at is the timeline. You're really looking at getting at least five years. You know, if you're doing two years, three years, you're, too, you're really dealing with an extended defect liability period. We need to get the, the actual thinking into routing maintenance. We need to move beyond just we've built it and it's okay to actually living day to day with all the things that occur on a network. We've got people wanting to put access ways on the side. We've got people filling our, goal, our culvert drains to get access to their properties. We've got uh, landslides come down. We have floods, we have storms, we have all of those things need to be there to actually start to learn and get better. And we of course need to actually avoid underbidding because one of the things we do see is that if we put a longer term contract out, often contractors, if they're not compelled to, will underprice routing maintenance. And then you're in a lose-lose situation where you've got no leverage and the contractor also has no enthusiasm. So we can use money to drive better outcomes. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so when we're talking about this continuum spectrum that I mentioned earlier of contracts, most of the time we're talking about when we're dealing with World Bank, ADB, um, and similar is right in that middle space. It's a medium term, you know, five to 10 years. So we're not talking about giving all the risk across, we're talking about some form of risk sharing. And that's an important part of these contracts is to actually understand you need to have thought about the risks and then you need to thought about, think about how would I share those risks with the private sector? So an example there, maybe small landslides, you know, the sort of thing you can pick up with a loader in a truck and have cleared in a day, that might be the contractor's risk. But if a whole hillside comes down, you step in as you would normally as a road authority and deal with it. So there's all these risk sharings need to go on. Next slide. And one of the ones we will see, and anyone who goes through this, is the risk of overloading. And my message here is quite clear. Overloading control sits with the road authority and the police. But to do a performance-based contract, you do not need to control overloading. What you need to be able to do is clearly define the risk of overloading that the road contract, that your contractor is actually covering. So the difference is, you know, you're not trying to pass across control and policing of way stations. What you can do is use things like much lower cost, way in motion and similar schemes to actually manage and record that risk. So you can say, this is the level of overloading that's out there. If it gets worse, then that's a you know, risk variation event, come and talk to us. But you know, we're not trying to say to the contractor, you have to be able to somehow magically um, control overloading when the road authority and the police have never managed to do it in the past. So again, when you're thinking of risk, 
think of how do I share this risk equitably? Who's actually best able to deal with it? Uh, next slide. Uh, I'll just deal very quickly on the last point here that the way we set up a maintenance component and how we actually define service standards, although these very min minor changes can have massive impacts on the way you actually measure and monitor and supervise these contracts. So, you know, think about the nuances of them. You know, if I say it's a, so many potholes per a kilometre, I can go once and I've got the answer. If I say it has, a pothole can be there for three days, I have to go back twice as a client to even see if the pothole was there again in three days' time. And that changes the way you supervise. It moves the contract from main, uh, proactive to reactive, all of those things, just around very simple changes. Uh, next slide. The advantages, the first up, um, cost savings. These are incredibly difficult to benchmark. The reason for that is if you think about most times we put in these contracts, especially in a developing um, context, we are taking roads which have never been maintained or have been grossly underfunded in maintenance. And we're saying this is now what it costs to deliver a good road well maintained. Fundamentally, it's very obvious there's going to be an increase in costs. And those increases in costs can be significant. However, when the study was done a number of years ago by a Finnish team and they went around and looked in places like the UK, North America, Australia, New Zealand, where they were comparing well-maintained and well-funded road maintenance under different models, they found that going to a performance-based longer-term model was delivering in that region of a 20 to 40% saving over and above what you were getting from a um, force account or an input-based contract. But what does come out of these contracts is a much more um, improved and consistent service level. And that's because that's what you're paying for. You know, and as was said, you know, what gets measured gets done. You know, if you are measuring and paying for service levels, you will get service levels. You know, when you're doing a force account, of course, you, you get expenditure. So you know, that's what you actually are, are paying for. And uh, you know, one of the things which we do get out of these is a much better focus on asset management. And that's understanding asset management and delivering of it, both by the road authority and the road contractor. Uh, next slide. And the reason for the linkage all the way back to road asset management, and I think this is under, you know, underpins uh, David's comment. You know, if you're going to do an asset management, uh, a performance-based contract well, you need to be able to know what assets you've got. You need to be able to define what a service level is and what the performance measures are around that. You know, what are the risks on your network? Where does it flood? What that's uh, um, going to fall down in an earthquake or anything else? And how are you going to allocate those? How are you going to audit compliance? What is the consequence of you know, non-compliance to you as a road authority and to the road user? And what's it going to cost to deliver this contract over five to 10 years period? And the reality, if you can answer those things, you're doing asset management. And that's the reality of these contracts. It's like a microcosm of asset management or a pilot trial of asset management. And that's what we really see these things as. And historically, if you go back maybe 10 years, it was, or 20 years, yeah, it was, we can't do performance-based contracts because we're not doing asset management. Now we sort of very much of that mindset of, if you're not doing asset management, do a performance-based contract, it will get you there because you have to. Uh, next slide. So, the, um, the first thing, as I said, we can use these contracts to drive that paradigm shift in the way a road authority thinks about their assets. And so it actually you know, gets us further and quicker along the asset management path. And although you can do good asset management with any form of contract, uh, you can do good asset management with force account, with input-based, output-based, or outcome-based, when we get to the outcome or performance-based contracts, it's easier. And that's the simple reality of it, because it forces all those difficult questions to be answered under a nice tight time frame. They're not the panacea to everything. You know, don't think that if we've put a performance-based contract in, in one part of your network, it has to be the same for somewhere else. These contracts work really well when we've got relatively stable things going on. You know, you wouldn't necessarily put these contracts right in the heart of a um, urban setting. And in, front, in fact, here in New Zealand, uh, our major city 
Auckland, the motorway network gets managed under a completely different uh, regime to the rest of the country because of all the different developments and challenges going on. There's certainly advantages, there's disadvantages um, to the PVC model. Overall though, there seems to be a lot more of an advantage there than there is of a disadvantage. These are well understood, they've been running for decades now. It's not something new, it's not a risky approach. We understand how to make them work. Um, but it's really important that you know, partnership and trust is, is key to the success. That's between um, your you know, ADB and the client, between the client and industry. You know, everyone needs to actually believe in this and realize that this is the way you're going. So I'll leave the rest for the question and answers. I, I don't think there's any more slides. You can just check, Michelle. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Greenwood. Um, uh, lots of important points there. These slides are going to be made to the public uh, so that you can always come back and refer to them. Um, please continue with the questions. There's certainly plenty coming through. Our next presenter is uh, Mr. Kananawa Tamoki, who is the JICA Transport Group Director. Uh, with a civil engineering background, Kananawa-san started his career with the Nippon Expressway Company before making his way to the Japan Highway Public Corporation, where he would work until joining JICA in 2002. For exemplary services when in charge of the infrastructure in Kenya, uh, the infrastructure sector, excuse me, he was rewarded with a move to Afghanistan in 2012. Um, since 2014, he has been in charge of the JICA road sector interventions, uh, where he carries oversight responsibility for a significant transport technical assistance and grant and loan portfolio that in 2018 was a $5 billion equivalent in value. Um, Adi B, are very pleased to welcome Kananawa-san to the Transport Forum as Japan's experience with an aging stock of major valuable infrastructure assets provides us all a valuable illustration of what awaits for each of our countries in the short to medium term. Kananawa-san, please, please assume control of the desktop. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Tomoki Kananawa from JICA. Thank you very much for this invitation of today's web seminar. My presentation title is Technology in Road Asset Management based on Japan's experience and JICA's project implement implementation experience. So this is a situation of a road infrastructure in Japan. In Japan, many road infrastructure were built around the 1970s or 80s, and they are aging now. Due to the aging, maintenance, repair, or rehabilitation cost will increase and burden the uh, society economy. Furthermore, possibility of a serious accident will increase. As a, re as a result, aging is a serious issue in Japan. Under this situation, Japanese government is trying to switch from breakdown maintenance to preventive maintenance for reduction of life cycle cost of road infrastructure. Next page. There are three issues for road maintenance and management in developing country. Lack of budget, lack of technology, and lack of human resource. For the solution of three issues, JICA carried out the technical cooperation project for establishment of road asset management in approximately 20 countries, including the status of preparations. JICA's technical cooperation project focused on the uh, activities in the red dashed line square. For the issue of budget, JICA project implements the establishment of the PDCA cycle for maintenance. For the issue of technology, JICA project implements the development of the manual standards on the maintenance and repair works. For the issue of human resource, JICA project implements on the job training in the pilot site. But for the dissemination of the PDCA cycle for road asset management, I think developing country needs further cooperation in the orange dashed line square after JICA project. Next page. SIP. 
クロスミニスティリアルストラテジックイノベーションプロモーションプログラム was carried out as a national project to promote advancement of science, technology and innovation. This program was promotion of end-to-end -end research and development based on collaboration between government, industry and academia from basic research to practical application and commercialization. SIP has 11 issues that answer critical、uh, social needs and offer competitive advantage Japanese industry and economy. And one of them was infrastructure maintenance, renovation, and management. Next page. For example, of SIP research and development, robot inspection technology, drone inspection, AI diagnosis technology, monitoring system for slope failure. Next page. Next. Yes. Under the situation in Japan, JICA established the platform for load asset management to accumulate all of Japanese experience and knowledge. Members of this platform consist of JICA and external experts in Japan Society of Civil Engineering or SIP researchers. Based on GE's experience and knowledge, JICA will provide the technical cooperation project to a developing country, and then we'll feed back our experience and knowledge to not only developing country, but also Japan. Next page. So, this platform has four main activities one is the support for technical cooperation project, one is the scholarship project, program. And one is the knowledge co creation program, and the last one is the other activities. Next page. Support for technical cooperation project is to introduce the advanced technologies. JICA takes a role to introduce the Japanese advanced technologies through JICA project to developing countries. Next page. For example, of the introduction of advanced technologies. This is a bridge inspection camera, easy operation, portability, and wide range of application introduced in Bangladesh. Next page. This is a simple and inexpensive load condition evaluation system. This system measures IRI, International Roughness Index, introduced in Kenya. Next page. This is a drone inspection. We can do the、uh, automatic deterioration extraction by AI. And we make 3D models but made by、uh, photo data.、Yes. Next page. This, this is an achievement of support from academia. In Zambia project, Japanese GIF University and University of Zambia concluded the academic agreement. To build up a system for human resource development of bridge engineers and technicians in Zambia. Based on this agreement, JICA project aims to establish a sustainable human resource development system for RDA, Road Development Agency, under the collaboration with the University of Zambia. Next page. Let me let you know, please,、uh, yes. This is a scholarship program. After JICA Technical Cooperation Project, we provide the scholarship program to implement the necessary research and development on road asset management to developing country. We already accept nine participants in master degree or doctor degree. In this autumn, we will accept 18 participants. Next page. 
Oh, and this is the、uh, knowledge co-creation program. We hold the seminar for advanced technology and attend the public exhibition, publicize our activities. Next page. And last one, other activities. We are developing the evaluation method for achievement of load asset management. Based on the evaluation of achievement, we will develop the strategical program approach for dissemination of load asset management in developing country. So, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Kanawa san.、Uh, now we will move into a, a number of questions that we will put to、um, the panel.、Uh, Whilst we're doing that, please continue to, to bring your questions in.、Uh, we have plenty of information and, and questions and comments and observations.、Um, I might call upon Director Ravi first.、Um, uh, the question is、uh, Estimates by ADB suggest that up to 2030, investment in transport s infrastructure of over $500 billion per year is needed to tackle climate change, eradicate poverty, and sustain growth in Asia and the Pacific. Um, how will ADB support its developing member countries over the next 10 years in closing the significant gap in investment needed for new and existing transport infrastructure? Well, thank you. Well, that's a really large scale question to answer. So,、uh, I, I guess the scale of infrastructure requirement, which in my view is actually understated because it basically looks at catching up rather than taking latent demand. Will actually be too large for any single entity to say that、uh, it can be addressed, be it government budget, be it、uh, an MDB. So it has to be kind of、uh, a collaborative、uh, approach between government agencies, commercial banks,、uh, private sector, and contractors to kind of even look at filling this、uh, kind of gap. Um, and that, I think, brings us to the question of having some replicable frameworks. So, the trend has been that we actually pick projects in some kind of isolation, and these are tried、uh, one after the other. And、uh, whether something in a project is susceptible to being picked up and taken、uh, into multiple k i n d of、uh, financing and Implementation scenarios. I think we need to really start、uh, looking seriously at that.、Uh, so, I think if I just keep the answer a little short, I think two or three things.、Uh, no single agency can get through this, whether government or private sector or multilateral development bank. We need、uh, extensive collaboration between everybody. We need、uh, to have a system of knowledge transfer which picks up good practices in one area. And then transmits it elsewhere. And even within in country, we need to focus more on、uh, mechanisms of value addition, which can、uh, actually be scaled up by somebody else rather than saying that, oh, this is, this is what、uh, one MDB does, and they will continue doing the same, and some, somebody else tries something else. Terrific. Okay, thank you, Director Ravi.、Uh, the next question、uh, goes to Mr. Haider.、Um, The failure to maintain roads has cost some countries very large sums in unnecessary investment and, in, and has imposed additional operating costs on road users that will burden future generations、uh, who will have to pay back the loans、uh, that have been used to rehabilitate and reconstruct poorly maintained roads.、Um, what lessons can you share on how these countries can improve their maintenance practices? Uh, you need to put your microphone on, please. Mr. Hayda, it, your microphone, please. There we go.、Uh, the best way of doing it is、uh, that you should adopt the system, and the system should be implemented in its true spirit.、Uh, Sometimes the money is not available, as you have mentioned, and sometimes we spend a lot of money on rehabilitation. Basically,、uh, as I was also mentioning in my presentation, that the prioritization of maintenance should be carried out first. That you should emphasize that routine maintenance is the most important thing in your maintenance. 
if you have done the routine maintenance, you increase the life. And then uh, the second most important thing is more overlays. The more overlays you carry out, the more uh, road is improved, the length will Im increase. Lesser amount should go to rehabilitation, more concentration on uh, road user facilitation like highway safety issues. And uh, because these are very important things, uh, life of a road user depends upon it. So if you start doing this and subsequently uh, evolve a system in which in a cyclic manner, you prioritize your uh, whatever the funds are and carry out the maintenance, it will work. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me let me please now move to, to the next question, um, and I'll I'll draw in Mr. Letter. Um, the question is: What are the key achievements of the six-year research for community access partnership program in improving rural access and transport services in Asia? Yes, thanks, uh, Dave. I think I can I can categorize that into three uh, areas of, of achievements. Firstly, the structured, consistent uh, uh, validation and updating and generation of data of a database or evidence base for cost-effective, safe and sustainable provision of, of rural access uh, through applied research. And, and that is the result of that is more than 1,500 uh, knowledge products that, that form part of the rural access uh, library. The second achievement is the raising uh, uh, of the awareness and profile of research among our partner countries. Uh, the critical factor there is, is that the, the demand-driven approach that was uh, um, um, adopted by, by RICAP meant that um, countries would actually define the research themes, identify and prioritize uh, research projects that address key gaps, key issues uh, uh, with respect to, to their infrastructure. And the success of that is also demonstrated in the uh, leveraged financing from the, from the countries themselves, which matched in uh, pound for pound uh, the, the, the uh, investment made by DFID into research projects. Uh, and in most cases, they actually exceeded the, the, the funding that was provided by DFID for research. Um, and, and importantly, the, the infrastructure, in, in the area of infrastructure, the findings, the innovations um, that came out as a result of the research uh, gained automatic embedment as, as part of policy and application across all the countries, which really showed that that is exactly what um, the, the, the research managed to address the key problems that they, they were facing. And, and finally, uh, the institutionalization of, of the research process, as I indicated earlier, that, that, that has provided a framework for, for continued and sustained uh, conduct of research in, in, the, in the rural, not only in the rural transport sector, but across across other other areas as well. Terrific, thank you, yeah. thank you, Mr. Letter. The, the the next question has come in um, for for Dr. Greenwood. Um, you recently contributed to a global review on the implementation of performance based road contracts for the World Bank. Um, what lessons can we learn so far from your efforts? Um, well, uh, as I mentioned, my um, presentation, I think the first thing is to not see the contract model as sitting separate from what you're trying to do as a business from a, a road authority point of view. So look at it as I am doing this trial of asset management and how does this contract get me there? Uh, if I um, step back and look at some of the early initiatives that we saw in New Zealand, um, what we struggled with there at times was the road network fundamentally changed as different contract models were trialed down the road because we didn't have the overarching, what are we trying to do as a, as a road authority um, thinking in place? 
But if you get that um, bigger picture in place, and then you say, I'm now using my uh, performance-based contract as a way to drive me towards that end goal. So I've thought about what service levels I actually want, and now I'm looking at how can I deliver that? How can I actually get my thinking clearer by separating out my goal and my role in terms of governance and management of a road network from the day-to-day -day delivery? And so there's some really good benefits to be had. And um, when we did the review um, of, I think there was about 40 or 50 contracts around the world, the significance was that there was huge benefit to be gained simply getting to the point where you'd put a contract to the market. Even if you never put the contract to the market, a road authority, if they've gone through the process of saying, I, this is ready to go, you've actually learned so much in terms of how, you know, what risks are out there, what would you think of risks, uh, what's it going to cost you to deliver, all of those um, are really good learnings for all road authorities to go through. Great, thank you. Thank you, some, some interesting insights there. We, um, I've got a few other questions that I'd like to put to the panel, but we're sort of time constrained and I don't want to cut back the Q&A session from, from participants. Um, Mr. Kananawa-san, if I can please ask you, um, what are the quality infrastructure invest, sorry, why are quality infrastructure investments important and why, uh, and what can we learn from JICA's efforts to implement the G20 principles of quality infrastructure investments? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the uh, David. For the economic development, we need the road net we need the road network to deliver the goods and passengers. For the new road network, we need the construction cost, but budget is limited. If we allocate the uh, uh, so enormous, enormous construction cost to construct the new road. We should allocate the small maintenance cost for the existing road. Quality infrastructure will be keeping good condition after construction, and we can reduce the maintenance cost for it. For, and for the new road network, adequate maintenance is very important, I think. Okay. All right. Look, I'm I'm going to go straight to the uh, to the audience questions here because there's there's um there's many more than we actually anticipated, and there's a lot of very good ones. Um. So so, I have got so many questions that I can possibly ask. I won't be able to ask them all, but let's let's get 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 into them. Um. Here we go. Okay, so the first question is from Ritu Mishra and a question to Director Ravi. Um, the recently published ADB Independent Evaluation Department report on the performance of ADB transport sector investments between 2010 and 2018 explicitly called for the promotion of program loans and results-based lending to incentivise road maintenance spending. Um, Across ADB operations, do you see country partnership strategies pushing our transport groups into meaningful road maintenance projects that can take advantage of these incentive schemes? Uh, okay, thank you very much. And uh, that's a very important and much debated question, I guess, uh, in ADB. Um, and one of the findings uh, has been kind of focused on the fact that if you actually take only project loans, then maybe maintenance is getting a backseat. And therefore, um, it is not, um, many projects are turning out what we call unsustainable or less than sustainable. And that um, is, the, I think, the basis for saying that we have, we need a different modality such as a program loan or a results-based loan, which looks exclusively at uh, maintenance. Uh, so my response on this will be a bit uh, equivocal. Uh, it's true that one of the main um, elements we can bring is to bring sustainability and road asset maintenance um, 
at the head of the table, so to say, and say that it's not just projects. We need to focus on asset sustainability. And if we do only uh, piggyback kind of maintenance uh, initiatives on road projects, these are not uh, the best way to do it, especially since the projects we do on the capital side are limited in length and distributed here and there. Uh, and as one of the other uh, panelists mentioned, if you have maintenance contracts kind of spread all over the place, then the network efficiencies of this are not actually garnered. So to that extent, I think it is extremely useful to look at uh, modalities. I'm particularly personal opinion, more in favor of uh, lending kind of modality. Um, and the other thing is, as I mentioned, one of the aspects uh, which we lack in road sector is proper data and a program loan or an RBL can actually look at uh, a whole region and look at sitting in places, uh, sitting in place, data collection, monitoring, using, uh, I saw some of the other questions which refer to artificial intelligence. So maybe deep, deep uh, data analysis and so on, which actually uh, help a lot. So for these, the program loans and uh, RBL would be extremely useful. We are uh, starting to look at it in some DMCs. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, the priority of many DMCs is to look at creation first and then look at maintenance later. And therefore, it's a kind of slow work. Um, on road safety, we are starting out an RBL in uh, India, which is by World Bank and ADB. It's a very large program of about $2 billion. Um, on road asset management as well, we need to look at uh, different modalities for engaging. As of now, there's no great demand from uh, DMCs. It's we who have to pitch it and say that uh, this, is, this is a requirement. Please help us out on identifying regions where uh, road asset management systems can be developed, road maintenance can be picked up. The other problem which uh, comes with this is again referring to, I was looking at the questions chat and Rebecca had raised this. Uh, there's also a requirement that in many cases, the assets themselves are weak. So if you look at many countries, the so-called national highways, uh, many of them are not even two-lane roads. District roads and village roads are in even poorer condition. So the first priority of many governments is let us get this road network proper and up to some standard, and then we will think of maintenance. Uh, these are real uh, issues which we need to grapple with. So yes, we need to look at other modalities. We need to put maintenance uh, on the forefront. At the same time, we need to realize imperatives of uh, uh, the governments and political systems to at least reach a base level of road network uh, before these can be actually uh, taken up. Um, so currently, at least in South Asia, we do not have exclusive road maintenance projects. What we are trying to do is on a project to have uh, almost all our contracts now have performance-based operations for five, 10, 15 years. And a hybrid annuity contract models in, in many of them, which run past 10 years. We also have included uh, asset database creations into the project. We need to look further. And once this is done, to get to the next stage. Um, yeah, I think that, that's my response. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Director. Um, an interesting question has come from uh, Mr. Pawan Kaki. It says, uh, did session discussions today portray the road maintenance promotion discussion as critical and very urgent? Yet MDBs continue to fund new roads in countries without adequate maintenance planning and prioritization systems. And so these new roads become unfunded maintenance liabilities for future generations. Why are MDBs doing this? Now, if it, it's not directed to anyone, would, would anyone in, in the panel wish to address this question? Obviously, it's a very difficult one. Um, I can, maybe. Please, Director. Yes. So, well, it's a very uh, valid and a very fraught question, because again, this is something which we need debating, uh, and we keep debating internally as well. So there are two parts of this. Uh, if the asset quality is of a certain level, which at least meets what we call basic requirements of transport system, then uh, we can say that you know you are not. You should actually focus on uh, the next stages of uh, operational efficiency. In many cases in our DMC, uh, these basic roads themselves are not available. Some of the roads look like lunar landscapes. 
and to even bring them to a basic level you need capital investment so i think at the first stage what we are uh, trying to do is not to say that we don't care about maintenance but to bring roads up to some standard and uh, move progressively progressively towards performance based uh, contracts or private sector investment contracts to some bot kind of model which enhances or improves the length in which the assets will be maintained under the same contract um and then once a network of roads is developed like we have some states in india which are going to that and operate maintain and stand uh, and toll kind of contract for a regional system of roads not just uh, one or two will then be given out either by the tmc uh, government itself or uh, using adb funding for setting up uh, some of this so question is valid but it's always a priority for decision makers to say should i improve my assets to reach a basic quality or should i just focus that unless i get 100% sustainability i will not do anything else on it and uh, we try to kind of uh, walk the middle path picking up asset development and mixing in asset maintenance into that thank you can i can i perhaps just add to that as a please as a consultant who works across a number of these projects um and i'm not disagreeing with the director but i think there's also a fundamental um problem that what is understood as being road asset management is not good enough within many of the mdb project managers team leaders whatever you want to call them so it's understood at a generic level what road asset management is but in many cases people say oh it's routing maintenance or others will think of oh it's a road fund or some think it's collect data and install hdm4 which is probably the worst thing you could possibly do to a, to a nation is install hdm4 um i remember one of the uh, senior adb folks that when i um did a review there a number of years back said any country that can implement and run hdm4 certainly doesn't need our help and i think that's probably the best quote ever and i say that as someone who developed hdm4 um so I, you know you look at projects across the adb world bank you can see asset management in the title yet there's practically zero focus on those items anywhere in the project the the funding of those is often less than the contingency of the overall project and there's no performance measures around it um cynically you could say it sits alongside uh catchphrases of climate resilience gender equality sustainability it helps gets a project gets a tick but when it comes to actually saying are we doing something that's very vague and you know asset management as a technical expertise it's measurable and the same way we can say we're going to take a piece of road from a to b and its iri is going to get reduced from x to y we can actually say asset management we're going to improve a certain component of it and get it from a competency of x to y you know so why is it that we're saying we're doing asset management yet you cannot find a decent defined project i'd say anywhere in the world by any developing member country that actually starts with what is the current competency of asset management what is it you're actually trying to deliver and where is the performance indicator because i think you're actually failing as mdbs to actually help these road authorities even understand what it is they're trying to do asset management is just this thing like we should be healthier and we all know that means some sort of blend of what we eat and what we exercise but there needs to be something better and i think there's a need to stand back and maybe even come up with a template of what does an asset management project actually look like not how do we tack on 5% of the budget for routing maintenance but actually how do we do an asset management project and i think until you start saying this is what we're going to do we're going to keep seeing you know people not comfortable to do these projects okay all right thank you dr greenwood um obviously we're hoping to to bring up these types of questions and inspire some some discussion on how we might learn uh to do uh business better um uh, let me move on um one of our project officers in in east asia rebecca stapleton has asked i noted in all the presentations the importance of prioritizing funding towards preventive maintenance this makes sense when planning for new roads to focus on prevention 
but how do you break the cycle away from spending on major rehabilitation on existing road networks, particularly when that rehabilitation work is needed? Um, in 2018 and 2019, 50% and 37% respectively of the city road network maintenance budget was reallocated from routine maintenance to significant rehabilitation works due to serious damage from rainfall events. This is quite a challenge. So how do we shift a road organisation away? How do we separate the road organisation from, from responding to those short-term efforts? Mr Hayder, I think you're the best one to, to take this question, if you don't mind. Thank you very much. Uh, Rebecca, question is excellent, I think so. But the most appropriate question, uh, because a lot of people think that rehabilitation is what maintenance is. We should improve and give a life to the uh, pavement, increase its life to a certain 10 years life cycle or uh, more than that. But the, my question will be that why we have reached a point when the road has gone to rehabilitation state? If proper preventive maintenance, routine maintenance was carried out, it would not have been uh, there at the first place. So my take will be that if a proper system is adopted, RAMS is properly working, uh, we are doing every uh, maintenance activity in a cyclic manner, we have a um, routine maintenance, we have periodic maintenance, mm -hmm. the need of rehabilitation is uh, will always be there. You cannot uh, get away with that. But uh, because we have limited funding available in most of the countries uh, in for the maintenance, because for development works, donors are there, they are happy with the economic internal rate of returns and benefits accruing from the project of funds are coming, but uh, funds are not coming for rehabilitation project. Uh, for rehabilitation project to come, you need a system, systematic approach that your entire network should go to a, such an extent that whenever there is a need, you should trigger the need for overlays rather than uh, asking your system uh, or your uh, road to deteriorate to such an extent that it requires rehabilitation. It should not go beyond that particular threshold value that now the remaining service life of your road is less than two, now you require rehabilitation. So the effort should be there, but uh, Rebecca question is excellent, you have to have some funding available for rehabilitation because you cannot get away with without rehabilitation. So it's important to balance out in your systems that rehabilitation will take so much funding, more concentration for overlays and uh, uh, preventive maintenance. Mr. Hayden, whilst I actually have you online here, there's another question that has come through from a, a Mr. Siam Balapatia. Um, he mentions you. You mentioned that there are there is resistance to uh, asset management within organisations. Um, in your view, what are the measures, the key measures to be taken to get the support of administrators, policymakers, and the politicians uh, for the establishment of this type of system? In my way forward, I have also mentioned that you have to bring all the top management on board. You have to emphasise to them. You have to tell them that why road asset management system is important for your road administration. You have to tell the politician what are the benefits he will accrue from uh, the road maintenance system. What are the uh, benefits which the stakeholder will accrue from your system. And then uh, they will be on board. Uh, we have faced such problems in Pakistan. We have, I have seen uh, in so many places, not only in Pakistan, but other places also, where the system was developed, the bridge management system was developed, the payment management system was developed, or the road asset management system, complete system was developed, but it was not implemented. 
because either the politicians were not agreeing because they wanted maintenance of a particular area which was in their constituency or in their uh, area of influence so they wanted money going there if you if you make them understand in their minds that the need basis is very important and you will benefit from it so they will come on board and that is what we have done terrific, terrific. Uh, and, yeah obviously um, having a data system to actually define what the need is and let them know what the cost of doing nothing is is very important in that approach yeah. but let me let me take an, a, a bit of a, a change in in direction we'll go to the rural access discussion a gentleman by the name of Mr. Mukun Kumar has, has addressed a question to Mr. Letter. Um, how can the rural access index be implemented while designing a project, given that many provinces and countries may not have such numbers or population surveys or, or, or have maybe outdated numbers? Thanks, thanks David. <clears throat> I think that that is one of the reasons why um, uh, Recap embarked on this updating of the rural access index so that it becomes a more accurate, um, repeatable, and sustainable. So the 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 RAI measurement two uh, that calculates the, the the index automatically uses open data sources such as WorldPop. OpenStreetMap and Gramp database. So that, that ensures that um, countries do not need to, uh, do not necessarily need to, to, to conduct these uh, expensive and time consuming field surveys to update their data. So they can, they can use these, these platforms to, to, to um, calculate the, the, the rural access index and use it uh, uh, as and when they need to. Obviously, there, there is need to um, validate some of these some of these data with the national statistical offices in country, so that um, whatever RAI is calculated, it is acceptable, and and the countries accept that that is the status in their own countries. But this this tool provides a, a quicker method of of assessing in, in global terms the rural access index in each country. Uh, using these these open data sources. Okay, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a, a question coming through from Fiji, um, Mr. from Mr. Albert Theralala. Um, he notes that Dr. Greenwood has worked extensively with both World Bank and ADB. Um, please ask him of the strengths and weaknesses of both the ADB and the World Bank in their approach to encouraging road maintenance and ask him to share his thoughts on what both organizations might do better. Um, I think the strengths and, you know, are probably consistent and the weaknesses are actually probably consistent about, across the both of them. So the strength is there is a desire. There's an unmistakable desire to do the right thing. And I think, you know, that's, that's great. So, the weakness is actually in delivering on that. Um, the, it's the way that the projects are scoped and then delivered. And part of it is, comes back to the, I guess, the funding cycle. So if you look at road asset management or put, you know, developing a road maintenance industry, you're talking five to 10 years. And of course that sits outside the time frame of many of your typical project cycles. And therefore you, you're needing, um, ideally a project manager, team leader, whatever the terminology is, with not only a lot of technical expertise, but a real tenacity to actually see that through. Um, the, the underlying projects still, in many cases, I, I guess you'd say is, today we'll reconstruct a road, tomorrow we'll build a bridge, the day after we'll do routing maintenance, and the day after that we'll do some data collection, put, a, put an HDM4 and away we go that doesn't align well when you're trying to actually change business as usual practices. And that's what led me to the comment earlier that I actually think what's needed is a really good template that says, this is how you go about a project, you know, from a road asset management point of view. You know, 
we should be working with the countries um, to say, let's do a proper asset management competency assessment or maturity assessment. And that belongs to the country and that identifies specific areas that they need to work on. One country, it might be improved risk. Another country, it might be they need a new asset management information system. Another country, it could be about the way they do condition data, whatever it happens to be. Then the, you know, the ADB, the World Bank could actually fund specific items and actually know that it's fitting within a cohesive whole. But at the moment, it's, you know, like I say, that it's trying to fit business as usual into a short-term project. And I don't think that's a natural fit, um, especially when there's then very seldom good performance measures even put around that component. So it, it gets treated like a contingency. And, uh, and I think when we, when we as an MDB downgrade rot routing maintenance and road asset management to being in many cases less, fu less um, funded than the contingency of the overall loan, it's hard for us to then say, oh, but it's really important to us when, when that's not where the money is. Okay. All right. Look, thank you, uh, Dr. Greenwood. I note that um, the CARIC uh, TA, uh, led by our very clever uh, Ko Sakamoto, actually did a lot of these maturity assessments in the CARIC countries. There's a, there's a knowledge product that, that captures that information. And in the folder, I will put that, that information there. It's very, very good reading and it's as relevant now as it was two years ago. Um, look, there, there is a question that's come through from uh, Sri Pense. It, it's, it's, directed, it's directed to uh, Director Ravi, but I will also ask um, Kananawa-san to, to, to help with this one. Um, what are the possibilities in development of artificial intelligence in road asset management? Director Ravi, can I ask perhaps you Go first. Uh, it's uh, actually intriguing. About 20, 25 years ago, I learned uh, coding for artificial intelligence languages. And the thought process at that time was that uh, this will somehow take over um, many things like structural design and so on. Been a long time in coming, not actually happened. Um, I think the key to this is uh, AI is a tool, assuming that you have consistent, clean, and voluminous data on which you can base your decision. I think in many of our DMCs, that uh, basis part is kind of lacking. So I think the first step is actually build in enough reliable uh, volume of data uh, on road conditions. And this is not just on some index number, but on a number of parameters. Which, uh, go into road condition and then try to analyze this. And AI is a tool which can probably help uh, once this kind of uh, consistent data in some volume is available on finding out what kind of uh, maintenance cycles can be done, how much it's going to cost, how you would prioritize uh, road maintenance based on traffic and need directed rather than the current one is, you know, if I get more complaints, on a particular stretch of road, it is due for maintenance. So yeah, it can be a tool to uh, enhance uh, the analysis and prioritization. But probably the first step we need is getting the data in place in a consistent, clean way. Sure, sure. Okay. Look, thank you for that. I've been, I've been, um, I've been hurried on. I, I need to close out the session. So. Um, Kananawa san please excuse me. Uh, I need to sort of follow on uh, with, with the timely closing. Um, thank you all very much for your participation today in this session. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, I encourage uh, you all to, to please tap into the rest of the transport forum. There's much to learn. Uh, download that app and um, and, and we hope that we've brought you some interesting thinking. Uh, make sure that you look at the references. There's some terrific reading uh, on all of the issues that we've, we've discussed today. Um, Michelle and Michael, thank you for your help today. And, uh, and please um, feel free to close the session. <laughs>